Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hong Kong Baptist University. She's Catherine Lee, and I'm Michelle Ng. Here in Hong Kong, we have some of the most expensive real estates and a large income gap. Government figures here show that the Gini coefficient in Hong Kong, a measure of income distribution, is 0.5, much higher than the 0.2, a level that would suggest equality. So we are a city that has to deal with homelessness as well as homes that are so tiny that you can barely turn around in. Here's Rachel Yao to tell us more. We take a look at the living conditions of families who live in so-called subdivided flats. These are apartments split into several units. According to the Census and Statistics Department, nearly 210,000 people live in such homes. Many of these units are located in old residential buildings. Some of them are in disused factory buildings where spaces are illegally boarded up to provide homes that are less than 48 square feet, roughly the size of a car parking space. Miss Chen is a single mother of two young children. They live in a subdivided unit in Hong Kong, on the same floor with 14 other families. That means one apartment is split into many different units. Every day, she has to cook, clean, and navigate her way around this 110 square feet space. She pays the equivalent of about 750 US dollars for a home that is approximately the size of a minivan. Hello, Expensive and cramped living conditions are common in Hong Kong. If we are in the Kuei-Ching area, the average is about 80-100 cents. In the last year, the average is about 4,000 cents. In the last year, the average is about 4,000 cents. 不少街坊或地產的代理都說,現在劏房可能平均都要去到5000或5500左右,即是上升趨勢的幅度都是大的。There is also a very long queue for government housing. 其實如果以我們接觸開的街坊普遍都要等6、7年的,我們都聽過最誇張的其實 on top of that, tenants of subdivided units constantly face the threat of eviction. These banners are the pleas for help. Wang Yun Tat is a local counselor who has been helping people living in these tiny homes. 政府一方面要真的要執法去任何一方面要有責法去任何一方面要真的要執法去任何一方面要真的要執法去任何一方面要真的要執法去任何一方面要真的要執法去任何一方面要真的要執法去任何一方面要真的要執法去任何一方面要
subdivided homes which damage the building structure or are in violation of land use regulations may be removed by the government. In order to qualify for resettlement, tenants need to file a writ in court to prove that they are homeless as a result of government demolition. That can take time, and some may end up on the streets. Hong Kong is a city of migrants. Most people here are descendants of those who have fled from mainland China due to war, political or economic reasons. But today, refugees here are struggling to survive. Ellie Wu and her team looked into the lives of those who are seeking asylum here. To qualify as a refugee, asylum seekers will well need to be assessed by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. They decide whether people have valid reasons to claim that their lives are under threat should they return home. In 2015, only 37% 30, of asylum, asylum seekers gained refugee status. But in Hong Kong, only 2 out of 100 cases were identified as a refugees. And simply waiting to be assessed can take years. Cheryl, which is not her real name, is an asylum seeker from Indonesia. She has been waiting for an immigration permit for four years. She lives in a 50 square feet subdivided unit with her two-year-old son. In my country, Sumatra, Lampung, we have fighting. It's because of religion. All my family ran away from our country. Then um, I choose to run go to Hong Kong and work. And after that, I'm not finishing contract with my employer, then I'm cooking and hosting. I'm very afraid with, uh, with my son's future. And in Indonesia, they're making uh, sickness from drugs and just they're just selling for, for our kids in school. Cheryl is one of more than 5,800 asylum seekers in Hong Kong, according to government figures. Seekers can go through the unified screening mechanism. A screening process with the government here to see if he or she is entitled to non refoulement protection. That is the right not to be sent home, for example, because they may face torture or inhumane punishment. The food coupon for me and for my child is enough. But sometimes we need more like um, vitamins. The government of um, Hong Kong don't allow us to work. I, I need to work because my son, for transport station, for the food, for the house rent, he's very correct. But we we think that we don't we are not good enough. But we don't have any choice. The problem is that who is executing this? Honestly speaking, a lot of these immigration officers. They don't have an international perspective. Without the real knowledge of understanding these countries, there's no way you can, you can assess fairly what's going on. They're controlled by people who have plans to get rid of these people. A kind of what we call a lump or a cancer. But Hong Kong has not always been that unwelcoming of those desperate for a safe place to stay. This is, after all, a city built by migrants, many of whom fled mainland China when communism swept across the country in 1949. They sought refugee here in what used to be a British colony. And such are the roots of many local families here today. Then, when the Vietnam War ended in 1975, more than 200,000 refugees came to Hong Kong by boat. But Hong Kong is one of the few developed places in the world that has not signed up to the United Nations Refugees Convention. That means the city has no obligation to take in those in seeking refuge. So, for asylum seekers like Cheryl, life in Hong Kong is like stuck between a rock and a hard place. Financial scheme or the humanitarian uh, uh, scheme is really a disaster. We are providing these people with $1,200 of food coupon, $1,500 of rental assistance, and some other allowance uh, for transportation. One can hardly find a place 
to stay with that amount of money and that the food coupon uh, value is certainly not enough. You allow these people to have conditional work rights. It's like say, if you have been here for more than three or four years, you should be allowed to work. And there are lots of jobs that are not, that no local Hong Kong people want to work in. I don't want his future to be bad because of my fault. If only for me, I don't need because I'm old already. Uh, for my son, yeah, some, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's only like that. If they can allow him to be Hong Kong people, I'm very happy. It's only his future. People from the Philippines make up the biggest foreign national population here in Hong Kong. Most of them are women who work here as domestic helpers. There are now 350,000 domestic helpers in the city, some of them from Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam, and some live in inhumane conditions. Here's Rachel Yao to, with the story. Last year, 9% of Hong Kong's workforce were foreign domestic helpers. By law, domestic helpers have to live in their employers' homes. And often, this means no escape from work. Some are forced to sleep in cramped spaces or work for prolonged hours without food. The exact figure of these victimized helpers is not known. Migrant workers groups tell us that some would choose to remain silent in order to keep their jobs. Sunday in Central, Victoria Park, Causeway Bay in Hong Kong. This is where some of the city's 352,000 domestic helpers, which is 9% of overall workforce, spend their days off. Under the government's live-in rule, these women, most of them from the Philippines and Indonesia, must live at the homes of their employers. So on their days off, there is nowhere to go but sit on the streets. The live-in rule was introduced in April 2003, was supposed to prevent workers from overseas competing with local people for jobs. The majority of people who support mandatory live-in believe that um, workers will work part-time even like when they finish working in their employer's home. And some might think that um, like they cannot control what they do in the, in the city or in the society. Uh, when, when they lived out. But spending 24-7 with their employers leave domestic helpers vulnerable to abuse. It means that it's very, very difficult to regulate how much they work because a domestic help is not going to say if somebody comes in at 2 a.m. in the morning and wants something to eat or whatever it is, she's not going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not on call. Even if they are allowed to live out, Many of their helpers probably cannot afford to. Most of them earn the minimum wage of just over 500 US dollars a month. The average cost of renting a 450 square feet flat is equivalent to 2,025 US dollars per month. Under their contracts, employers of domestic helpers are supposed to provide decent living conditions. Such working conditions take a toll on the health of the helpers. In 2016, right. over 100 foreign domestic workers died in Hong Kong. And majority of them it's, uh, died from illnesses, but those are stress-related. They might call the agency for help. Usually the message they get from the agency is, Go back to your employer, be obedient, and do as she says, and you'll be fine. Three years ago, the horrific beating of one Indonesia helper, Ariana, by her employer shocked Hong Kong. Her employer is now serving six years in jail, and Ariana won 103,000 US dollars in damages. Workers' rights groups have campaigned for the scraping of the live-in rule. 
Nancy Lubiano, a Filipino domestic helper, lost her judicial review earlier this year. A government spokesman said publicly two years ago that there is no shortage of local people who are willing to take on domestic worker jobs. So there is no sign of change on the living room for these women anytime soon. An estimated number of 1,800 people in Hong Kong are homeless, according to government data. Some of them work, but simply cannot make ends meet. Our reporter Amy Ho has more. The government here in Hong Kong wants a number of shelters for homeless people. When we started working on this story, we were wondering why people choose to sleep rough rather than go to these shelters. We find out that staying at a shelter is often not convenient and sometimes unsafe. We then find out that some would pay the price of a cup of coffee to spend their life somewhere you do not quite expect. It is the middle of the night and people are snoozing. But this is not an airport terminal or a train station. This is in fact the 24-hour McDonald's in the impoverished district of Sam Shui Po, where some of Hong Kong homeless people seek shelter every night. Kong Hong Man is one of them. More than 900 people were homeless at the end of 2016, according to government figures. That's nearly two and a half times as many as 10 years ago. They can choose to sleep in government-run centers like this one, but social worker Clarence Y says few people choose to do so. Some of those who end up on walkways like Shan, an other street sleeper, actually prefer this to a government shelter. A lot of homeless shelters have serious hygiene problems. Yomate Shelter, under Street Sleeper Shelter Society Trustee Incorporated, is built above the public toilet and a garbage station. There is an indecent smell of urine and cockroaches and mosquitoes breed in holes around in this area. And even finding a good spot outside isn't easy. Park benches are often designed such that they are uncomfortable to sleep on. Like I hope we have helped you to understand some of the problems with homelessness and shelters here in Hong Kong. We hope to join you again next year on Global News Relay. Goodbye, Goodbye from, from Hong, Hong Kong. Kong.